coming to you from the jive city of board gaming, Omaha, Nebraska. Welcome to the Out of the Dust podcast. I'm your host, Waylon Bryce. Tied in with the popular recurring Out of the Dust geek list on Board Game Geek, the Out of the Dust podcast is a weekly podcast that is focused on re-exploring games we play that we hadn't previously played in a year or more. Why did the game get dusty? Why did you decide to dust it off? How does the game compare to how you remembered it? Are you likely to play it more often in the future? These are the questions that we're interested in examining on Out of the Dust. This week on the podcast, episode 42. On the Out of the Dust segment, I'll bring Aqueduct out of the dust, and a contributor will dust off Cheat. On the Reaction segment, I discuss the Spiel de Jaris nominations. On the What I've Been Playing segment, I review Gentis. On the Obscure Bryce Game segment, I review Dinosaurs of the Lost World. And we wrap up the episode by taking a look at game number two on my top five favorite Kickstarter countdown. I had a chance to bring Aqueduct out of the dust recently. Aqueduct is a 2005 tile-laying game from publisher Uberplay and designer Bernhard Weber, an obscure if somewhat prolific designer still getting stuff published. Aqueduct is one of only two of his 23 credited titles, with more than a thousand registered owners on BGG. His most well-known game is probably the children's game Chateau Roquefort, which sits at number 11 on the overall children game rankings. There are a handful of games in my collection that I've played before, but I don't have any log plays of because the last time I played them was before I started logging play seven years ago. So that's my estimated dust level on Aqueduct, about seven years. I've been gradually working my way through these played but unlogged games and evaluating them to see if I want to keep them around or not. Aqueduct goes in the keeper pile. It's got that classic Euro feel of pasted on theme, but with elegant and interesting gameplay. It's a straightforward game, but the decisions are meaningful. There might be some luck involved in how the settlement tiles are placed, but evaluating the chances of things happening and what other players choose to do is a key part of the game that sets it apart from other titles of the same time period. This was a hit at my monthly Obscure Bryce game demo, and we played it twice in a row. It might get dusty again because, while it's a pasted on theme, it is a boring pasted on theme. It will be interesting to see if the more interesting mechanics can help the game from accumulating so much dust in the future. Let's see what a contributor brought out of the dust. T Nomad, username Tommy Nomad, brought a classic card game Cheat out of the dust. Cheat is also known as I Doubt It, though I think most people will be familiar with its third moniker of BS. In case you've never heard of it before, it's a bluffing and deduction game played with a standard deck of cards that's been around for an uncertain amount of time by an uncredited designer. The complete rules can be found in the game description at BGG. Tommy last played it about 20 years ago. He writes, By adding this item, I'm kind of cheating, or not, on two levels. We recently moved, and Shinomad and I spent yesterday hanging light fixtures and shelves. So everything is under a fine layer of dust. When we were teens, my brother, the card player, taught us this silly family game. He was a master, hiding cards almost everywhere about his person and on the table. On his way to victory, he even hid cards on other players. So subtle was he. In the move to the new house, a bicycle deck was discovered. And my kids, raised on designer games, were enthralled by the colors and symbols of a game with which so many games could be played. So I taught them cheat. Good fun. And there's no way I've played it in at least 20 years. Thanks for the contribution, Tommy. I think the last time I played this game was way back in high school. I was pretty good at it. I have an honest face, trustworthy countenance, and persuasive tone of voice that has enabled me to get away with many things, including success at this game over the years. Reaction segment time. I haven't given my thoughts on the Spiel des Jahres nominations yet, so that's what I'm going to do this week on the reaction segment. I haven't played Wear Words, but I have played the similar Insider, which was okay, but a glorified version of 20 Questions is not exactly what I consider worthy of this prestigious award. I know nothing about Llama, but as a Knizia game, I'm interested enough in at least giving it a shot sometime. I only learned just one this last weekend and was impressed. I like word association games, and this is a fun one. Unusually, I had an equally good time guessing the clues as giving them. Usually it's one or the other in this type of game for me. I also like that the game is cooperative, which feels like a good fit for the mechanics. It's also a genuinely challenging game to succeed at. I've only played it once, but we did not do so well, only guessing four clues right amongst five players. Sadly, we were unable to play the game again after learning it, but I can see this being the sort of game where that would happen a lot. I will echo the concerns of others, though, about the committee nominating three party games for the Spiel des Jahres. 
Where the line between the spiel and kinderspiel has been uncertain in recent years, now the line between the spiel and kinderspiel seems to be blurring. But overall, I do feel the committee did a better job this year in assigning games to appropriate categories than last year. I remain resolute in my belief that Ganshan Clever and I Quackshaber von Kordenberg were more appropriate spiel nominees than kinderspiel nominees. An argument could be made that all three of the Kennerspiel nominees, Detective, Carpe Diem, and Wingspan, are comparable in complexity to Spiel nominees of several years ago. But compared to the Spiel nominees this year, everything is in a more appropriate category. As a deduction game, I don't have much interest in Detective personally, but I can respect the innovation it brings to the table. The popular consensus has Wingspan winning the Kennerspiel easily this year, but I think Carpe Diem's fascinating and innovative scoring mechanism makes it a sneaky pick too. The committee is notoriously unpredictable, though, so who knows. But I wouldn't have a problem with either Carpe Diem or Wingspan winning. This week on the What I've Been Playing segment, I'm going to tell you about Gentis, the new game from publisher Tasty Minstrel designer Stefan Resthaus. Well, kind of a new game anyway. It was originally published in 2017, but flew under the radar, and it has taken a deluxe edition Kickstarter for the gamer population at large to take notice of it. That deluxe edition was quite delayed, but has finally recently fulfilled, and I'm relieved to note that it was worth the wait. The deluxified components are great, of course as one has come to expect from Tasty Minstrel. But one interesting thing about the Kickstarter that I want to make sure to mention was that there was a stretch goal for a custom folded space foam insert. Now, a lot of people were not happy with how this insert turned out, but I want to acknowledge that the idea of a custom insert as a stretch goal is very cool, and it's something I wouldn't mind seeing more of. As for myself, I thought the insert turned out fine. It definitely took some time to assemble, but the end result is a nice insert that is very functional for me. But here's how the game works. Gentis is a civilization-building game in which players pay a combination of time and money to take actions to increase their population, add civilization cards to their hand, play civilization cards for points and effects, and build cities around the Mediterranean. These actions are represented by tiles, and the central mechanism of the game has players place the tiles themselves, and the time tokens the tiles cost on a personal time track when they are claimed and paid for. When a player's time track is filled up, the round is over for them. It's a clever mechanism and really makes players try to plan the most efficiently way possible. The rest of the game pretty much revolves around those civilization cards as they are the primary way to earn points, and grant players special abilities or various forms of income during the course of the game. The card play is lots of fun, and finding ways to make the civilization cards work together is my favorite part of the game. I was a little concerned at first that the city-building aspect of the game felt tacked on, and not complementary to the rest of the game that revolves around the civilization cards. But that aspect of the game has opened up some for me now, so that the game feels like a cohesive package after a few plays. That's a good thing! I like it when a game continues to open up and reveal aspects of itself several plays in. I'm having a lot of fun with this one, and I'm expecting more plays of it going forward, as it has been positively received by everyone I've shown it to so far. Obscure Bryce Game Segment Time. This week on this segment, I'm going to tell you about Dinosaurs of the Lost World, which is also one of my top 10 games of all time. Dinosaurs of the Lost World was published by Evelyn Hill in 1987 and would become one of the last Evelyn Hill games made. It's a literary game based on the serialized novel The Lost World by Arthur Conan Doyle. And in Victorian England, the novel's protagonist, Professor Challenger, was just a little less well known than Sherlock Holmes. I've mentioned the game briefly a couple of times over the course of the podcast. The first was in an early episode as a formative game in my board gaming history. More recently, I mentioned the game briefly a few episodes ago in the context of being one of the games I played at Tricon in Sioux City. But I always like to make sure I hit some of my all-time favorites in my birthday month of May, so I took it off the shelf again a couple of weeks ago to teach to my nine-year-old son, Luke. Here's how it works. Players are leaders of various expeditions stranded on a South American plateau populated by dinosaurs. Part of the game is a roll and move, where players advance around an outer track collecting useful tools, die mitigation experience cards, resolving positive and negative story-driven event cards, and moving dinosaurs on the central plateau map. 
The space on which the players land on the outer track also has a hex number printed on it, which dictates the number of spaces a player can move on the plateau map, which they do after resolving their outer track space. The map is populated by upside-down exploration tokens, the desirable ones being various dinosaur habitats. Each of these dinosaur habitats has a corresponding sideboard divided into comic book-like panels. Instead of moving to and exploring a new hex, players can instead have one of these dinosaur adventures. The tools players have been finding and collecting grant players various quantities of die mitigation experience cards to help them maneuver through the dinosaur adventure sideboards, the purpose of which is to accumulate victory points. When a player has accumulated 25 victory points and found an escape item, of which there are several hidden in the event deck and the exploration hex tokens, they can go to a particular adventure sideboard and try to escape the plateau by successfully completing that one. The player who does this first wins! When players say there is no such thing as a good roll-and-move game, Dinosaurs of the Lost World is my evidence to the contrary. It's also the most thematic and immersive game I've ever played. Every element of the game sucks players into the unfolding story, and it's the type of game that is just an absolute joy to experience, even if you don't win or are even particularly close to doing so. It's the type of game where you just sit back and relax and just enjoy the experience. And the customization that goes into initially outfitting one's expedition and modifying it throughout the game, combined with the modular and random exploration elements of the event cards and exploration hex tokens, ensure no two games unfold even remotely similar. There's also a wonderful sense of tension in the game as players weigh the risks and rewards of getting too near the dinosaurs on the board or on the adventure sideboards. Losing a fight to a dinosaur can have temporarily devastating ramifications, and trying to avoid those at all costs is a very real challenge. There are some fun minor variants and modifications posted on BGG that I highly recommend, especially the one that introduces a variable player power for each expedition by specifying what type of expedition players are playing. This latest play with my son was a huge success. He really got into it. Of course, moving dinosaurs to attack me was lots of fun for him, but he also enjoyed allying himself with the Indians, using their benefits to his advantage, and reaping victory point rewards from them. He had a definite strategy in place, and it worked out well for him as he escaped from the plateau before I was ready to do so. We continue my top 5 favorite Kickstarters I've back count down this week with number 2 on the list. When gamers mention the name Richard Breeze, they naturally, and rightfully, think of the Key series of games. But my favorite Richard Breeze game is not part of the Key series. In fact, it's one of the few non-Key games he's designed over the years. Inhabit the Earth, a tableau-building race game with the theme of filling up Earth's continents with one's animals. It's a fun theme that works well with the game's mechanics. Speaking of mechanics, I think the combination of tableau building with the race win objective is brilliantly done here. This combination has been done before in a more abstract way, but the presence of actual race tracks on each continent creates a wonderful tension in the game as each player's animals get closer and closer to the end of those tracks. And uncommonly for a race game, Inhabit the Earth is a very deep game with a complex, in a good way, intertwining system of iconography and special abilities. It's a joy to find tableau building combos in this game and very satisfying to see them come together in successful ways. But no discussion of Inhabit the Earth would be complete without mentioning its controversial cover art, which is purposefully inspired by an old Ravensburger game, Wildlife Adventure. But something happened in the course of that inspiration, and while the animals on the cover of Wildlife Adventure look just fine, the ones on the cover of Inhabit the Earth look a little odd, stoned, and in some cases outright horrifying. It's jarring enough to have landed and inhabit the Earth on multiple worst cover art of all time lists. As for myself, I find the cover art very charming. I love bad art, so inhabit the Earth cracks me up every time I look at the cover. Well, that will do it for episode 42. Thanks for listening. Feel free to join the Out of the Dust podcast guild at BoardGameGeek.com. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Out of the Dust BGG. Leave a comment at the guild, PM me on BGG under user handle Radagast14 or email me at radagast14 at centurylink.net. And join the Out of the Dust conversation yourself at our monthly Geek 